All right, today we are starting in uh, Genesis 2. And we did the first four verses last week, but we'll read them again. We'll read the whole chapter, and then we'll go back and look deeper into it after we read the whole chapter. I'll start. I got the new King James version. <clears throat> Julie's joining up with us. Who's the other J? Jeff Satterfield and Julie. Oh, Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, Jeff. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. All right, we'll start. Genesis 2. <clears throat> Plus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it, he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, or before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. There was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth, of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Somebody else want to read there? 10, verse 10. Who's next? You can be. <clears throat> verse <Okay>. 10. <laughs> uh, verse 10. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there it divided. It had four head streams. The name of the first is the Pishon. It's, it winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx also <clears throat> are also there. The name of the second river is the Gion, and it winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, and it runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work, work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from the tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. <coughs> And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. And so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God called the man to fall into a deep sleep, uh, caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with, with flesh. And then 
the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. All right, so there was a lot there. There's a lot there. Well, stuff happened on the mm. second chapter here. Any overall comments? Right, let's work on it here. <laughs> So he rested on the seventh day. We had talked about that last uh, time. Blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in, in it, he rested from all his work God had created and made. It's good to have that rest period. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Sometimes we try to go without rest, and it doesn't work out good. I always say I can go on <clears throat> five hours of sleep, maybe for two days, and then on the third day, I careen into a guardrail. You know, <laughs> when I'm driving, you know, I can't stay awake. Can't stay awake. And the same if you don't, we don't get our, if you don't take our rest day on Sunday or whenever, you know, it takes one day to rest. I mean, you can really get in, you can really get bogged down. So it's just awesome the way God is so wise. And so, and created us for that too, I think, you know, he knew that we would need that. Um, What's the saying? All work and no play makes Jack a doll boy. Right? <laughs> in a place in Hebrews, it says, for whoever enters God's rest also ceases from his labor as God did from his. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that has an inner component to it that, that uh, uh, God doesn't think very much of, of self-effort. It doesn't get very high marks. And uh, he wants us to rest in him somehow. Yes. Yeah. It, it, you're never going to get ahead by not resting that seventh day. You can think, oh, I'm going to get more done. But if you don't rest, then you, you continually just slow down, right? You get less and less mm -hmm. done on those days. And there's, would have been, yeah. there's a principle too there when you obey the lord then he's able to work and cause things to happen in ways that if we're not in obedience with him we can't experience and mm -hmm. i've personally sometimes struggle with just taking a, a whole day to rest i mean i probably shouldn't say that in this company but sometimes <laughs> it happens mm -hmm. but there have been times specifically when I had a lot to do on a particular week, and Monday is typically the day that I don't schedule anything, and I try to take that as the Sabbath. And I felt very strongly that in spite of all that had to be accomplished that week, I felt the Lord telling me I needed to not do anything that, that day. And I did that. And the most amazing thing happened. The rest of that week, I got more done. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, and I felt less stress. And I feel like that God was able to work through that simply because I obeyed him when it didn't seem to make sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like Chick-fil-A, they don't, they don't open yeah. on Sunday. And the business model might say, oh, my, you know, you're missing out on one of your busiest days. Mm -hmm. And it will never work. And now I think they're the number one. 
They're always busy. Fast food. <laughs> they are. Yeah, they're always. They're, they're never, I don't think I've ever been there that they've not been crazy right. busy or passed by that they're not been. Not so it might be just a, a principle or a law, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, if you do this, you'll be blessed. Basically, I heard it pointed out once too that the the sequence of events is God creates for six days and rests, but man is created on the sixth day, and then begins out of that seventh day, and so man's first day was rest. Man's first day was in that period of rest, and then God set him in the garden and told him to do all of the things. And and, and that's an interesting principle for us because we feel like we have to work, work, and rest from our work like God did. But when God created man, we rested first and then worked out of the rest that we had done. Yeah. Something to consider. Yeah. He made it a holy day, too. Hell yeah. Sundays are always tempting in the cold months to work because you get paid double. Mm -hmm. you know, right? They did it. I don't know what they do now. It used to be you get paid double time to work on Sundays. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes it's, it's my mother always is still going to be you know, <laughs> to rest on Sundays. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. I always tried to. Okay, definitely, definitely, it's a good thing to take a day of rest. I'm a pretty good napper. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. So. Good for you, napping. Twenty minute power nap. No more than twenty minutes. <laughs> Just be twenty minutes. Really? Yeah, it's all you need. I think I break that rule. Rejuvenate. Twenty can, minutes. Can you get? Can you get? Barely asleep in 20 minutes. That's what they say. I can't sleep. I sometimes There's been yeah. studies about that, that 20 yeah. minutes is yeah. like what you need for a nap. If you sleep longer than that, like you go into your deep sleep. So just to like refresh you, 20 mm -hmm. minutes is supposed wow. to be a long enough nap. This number of Verse 4, this is the history of the heavens and the earth where they were created. In the day of the Lord, God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, or any herb of the field had grown, the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And that's where some people, I mean, you can get that there was no rain before the flood, basically. <clears> that <throat> just this mist covered the ground, watered the plants. There was no rain. And that's one of the reasons why Noah's prediction or prophecy that it was going to rain was so crazy to the people because mm. they, it never rained. And why would you, you didn't even know what it was? <laughs> mm. uh, because of the, some people think the water was split, you know, there was water above and below, so it didn't rain. <clears throat> Said no one, there was no, there were no, no, there was nobody around to work the ground. No one to till the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. That's a profound statement there. <laughs> you know, what's in, what is encapsulated in that verse? <laughs> Everything. We wouldn't exist without that verse, without God forming us. And um, from the dust of the ground, it is neat that, you know, physically, if you were to fall over dead out here in the field, you would turn back into dust. There would be nothing. You were formed from the ground, from the earth. And I think Adam, the, the, 
the Hebrew word for Adam is like earth or something. And he was formed in the ground, from the ground, raised up from the ground. But, <clears throat> it, you know, dust to dust, back to dust. The um, thing that makes us unique is God breathed his spirit into us. So that the breath of life, we became a living being. So, uh, how does the, um, I mean, in chapter one, it already is talking about God saying, let us make man in, in the image. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he created man and, and gave him the land to take care of, right? Isn't that already in chapter yeah, God, one? Uh, and, then, and then it comes again in chapter two. He goes into more detail on how we, we were made from the earth. It's definitely a repeat, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God created man in his the own days. image, right. the image of God who created them. It was done on the days. Right. Say that again. Like it tells, like on each day what oh, God yeah. did. So, you know, on the sixth day, he created man. So, and then I think then in chapter two, it just goes into more detail. Goes back and gets a like about detail. the whole. Yeah. yeah. In, in Hebrew literature, a lot of times is circular. Um, and if you think of the book of Revelation, too, it, it actually covers the same events at least twice as, it, as you read through it. Um, and it's not just one long beginning to end as, as we typically think of writing, but they would, they would go back and reemphasize certain things and tell parts of the story again. And I think uh, where he said breathe, breathe his breath, uh, the word the word in the Hebrew, as I understand it, and I'm no Hebrew scholar, but the word is pretty much interchangeable either in, in the Bible when it appears. It's either the breath or the spirit. And it's almost the translator's choice whether he sticks in their breath or spirit, um, which is, you know. <clears throat> There's one other time that uh, God breathed on the men. Yeah, well, Ephraim. Yeah, Ephraim. Yeah, when he, when Jesus breathes on them and says, "Receive my spirit," and some people think that uh, through sin, right, we lost a part of that uh, spirit. And then after Jesus was raised from the dead, we are born again, reborn, born of water. He says we're born of water, and then we're born of the Spirit. And then he breathes on them again. And it's almost like a recreate, a recreation, right? He's breathing the Spirit back into humanity. Because they're able to receive it again because they, you know. So I thought that was... Neat how recreating us and and it, and you know and many times it said that we're a new creation when we're reborn, a new rebirth. Uh, and became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man in the heat that formed. And out of and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight, good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And some people say, why did he put those trees? In the garden, if he knew that we were going to take a bite out of him, you know, everything would have been perfect if he just wouldn't have put that tree there, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, he made us different than the animals. He gave us free will. And um, without a choice, right? You can have free will, but if there's no choices to be made, do you really have free will? Mm -hmm. So we put the 
trees in the garden to so that we could demonstrate we could actually what do I want to say you know, so that we could actually have free will we can you have free will but if you never have a choice so I don't know. I can't. Remember, I can't find the word to what it's doing, but it's demonstrating free will. Or well, you can't obey unless there is the potential to disobey. You right. can't choose to trust God unless there is an option where you could make a choice to demonstrate your lack of trust of God. Mm -hmm. And so that then, in order for that to be, it had to be set up that way. But I think there's there's a whole other aspect to this because that that question about like if if God knew they were going to take a bite and, and why did He let that happen and and He could have just made it perfect that's a very human centric lens to look through that makes it all about us and it really isn't and we have to remember that that the human existence is being played out on a cosmic stage in front of the powers and principalities of the air um satan who existed before we did um and was cast down because he tried to assert himself over god i feel like the human life in many ways all of our existence is sort of mirrored in the story of job where satan says he only loves you because you're good to him and you know if, if you take stuff away and the whole idea is is that job chose to trust god and to not curse god no matter what life was like he trusted god <clears throat> more than he trusted his circumstances and that's the choice and the invitation that we're given is to trust god no matter what and adam and eve obviously failed that choice <laughs> jesus made good and reversed the curse and now he invites us to to receive his victory over that um, in the same way and so I, I feel like it's larger than well if we were just never eating that apple we'd be perfect and, and i think it's the story is bigger yeah definitely um uh, like uh romans says that for all of creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope because creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of god and when we aren't aware of the age to come and the justice that god will um bring for every act of injustice and making all things right then it does seem like you could accuse God saying, why is all this happening? And when you recognize that his act of creation is greater than just, like when we get born again, that's the beginning. And so the new creation actually comes forth at the resurrection. And so this time in this evil age, having the deposit of the spirit is ordered has a purpose for us to overcome like how could something really be formed in someone without it being tested and so the time between when we're born again until he comes is when he is forming his image back in us as we're being tested through circumstances that um require us to draw from his overcoming life in us you know yeah. so it's it's something that is like in really i don't know how to say it but it's it's something that's tested and proved and and worked into us versus just something that happens to us you know it also reveals his identity as the god who saves you know like yeah. he is the God who saves and uh, yeah. we need Satan. And Satan would have us receive all of the punishment for our sin, but God uh, in his love makes a way for that to not have to happen. I think it also reveals something about the nature of God. Notice that he told them 
you know, which tree he told them they weren't allowed to eat from. Mm -hmm. It shows that he's in, he's in control of, of everything that's happening. He yes. knows what's going to happen. He's he knows, you know, he's taking care of everything the way he wants it to go. If he would have told him to not eat of the other tree, what might have happened? Yeah, they could uh, live forever in their cursed state. <clears throat> now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Hishon, the one which skirts the whole land of Evala, and where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Dalam and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gaishon, is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hadikul. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, these would have been rivers at the time. This would have been before the flood. And during the flood, all of this landscape would have been changed. Would have been rerouted. Would have been totally decimated. <clears throat> um, I like the flood um, stuff and uh, how they got uh, satellite imagery of Africa now in the desert. And there's these huge uh, things. They look like ripples in the desert. And uh, if you would look at them, you would, you would it, like, declares that there was this huge passive body of water and like there was these ripples out and it's like a quarter of Africa that has these huge ripples. Uh, I think in the east, in the out west, there's in the plains, there's these huge holes in the ground. And they think that those were uh, formed by the, a rushing torrent of water. that has like a whirlpool in it. And the whirlpool would actually have dug into the ground in these huge make these huge uh, holes in the ground. Um, I know, it's amazing. It's amazing the how much the earth would have changed during the flood. So we can't go over to somewhere and find these four rivers and find where the Garden of Eden is. Yeah, and, and that, that was something that you had said a while back, that, that during the flood, it seems pretty obvious, and it wasn't obvious to me until you said it, that Eden was probably left underwater. Yeah, and it could have been in the Persian Gulf, basically. Yeah. If, if Eden was in the Persian Gulf, right? And then <clears throat> when, the, when the water fell out of the sky from the, and the earth opened up, and, and if you believe in the Ice Age, the giant... Um, you know, like Lake Erie would have been under two miles of ice. So, the, the, you know, it's hard to even fathom that, but the glacier that carved out Lake Erie was two miles high of ice. <laughs> it's unbelievable. The earth is still rebounding from the glacier that carved out Lake Erie. Like there's, there's rivers that like a hundred years ago streams streams used to go this way and now the earth is still rebounding from the weight of that massive glacier and now it's recovered and now the streams flow the other way because of the rebounding of the earth but those huge glaciers probably would have melted in the flood which would have raised the ocean levels so i think the garden of eden is in the persian gulf covered over by the water of the persian gulf but <clears throat> It is pretty, it's amazing when you look at the satellite imagery. Is there such a thing as bad gold? The bad gold? Well, it would have been the, you know, the, the ore 
content of gold in the ore. Yeah. So there's the ore, gold has an ore. And so if it's 90% gold in the ore, it'd be a lot easier for them to make, to melt it down and get more gold. But if you have a less content of gold in the ore, then you have to, like over in Africa, they truck 300 tons of gold and they'll get one ounce or whatever. Yeah. You know? my, my translation says where there's gold, gold from that land is pure. Pure. Well, I have a question about those rivers, the Euphrates. I'm not great with geography, but isn't there still a Euphrates? There's still a Euphrates. Yeah. And then what was the other name? Um, Jeff, yeah, the third ones. river name. You, you had a different name than Tigris. Tigris. Yeah, isn't there <laughs> still? Tigris. Yeah, Tigris like those Tigris. rivers are still. Well, yeah, but they're probably not the same. Like they're the same name. Yeah. But they're probably not the same. They wouldn't be the same. Probably not the same river. The Euphrates is drying up. For the precision of it. The Euphrates yes, the prophecy of the Euphrates drying up, you know, and there's a lot of claims that it is drying up now. It is. I know it was at its lowest point it had been. Um, I think it's from damming. There's some damming uh, going on. Mm -hmm. That they didn't think was going to happen, and they're filling up huge basins, all kinds of, and people are using the water, and it's actually drying up. Interesting. Fourth River, you create. <laughs> then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And I think it's funny that God created <coughs> fruit trees, right? If you leave a fruit tree on its own, and you don't tend it at all, it'll get way more branches than it needs. Um, it'll get the fruit will be small. There'll be lots of it, but it'll be real small and it won't be very good uh, to eat. And if you see like an actually tended fruit tree, it's amazing, you know, how much it could produce. And it's just funny that God would create things that need to be tended, right? Mm -hmm. um, or can be tended. Like, I just think that's awesome. Well, and that 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 gives yeah purpose right, to yeah. to the day to day activities because he he put man in there to work the garden. And he could, I know what you're saying. I mean, God could have tended the garden by himself without getting man involved. Yeah, he could have created a, an apple tree that doesn't need tending. <laughs> but it's amazing how how often, uh, I don't know quite the right word is, but the God wants to pull man into the whole process, like, like when Ezekiel saw the valley of dead bone. Well, God could have dealt with those problems without getting Ezekiel involved, but he he uh, he said, "You speak to." Me. He says to Ezekiel, "You speak to me. Well, tell him to whatever." And uh, it, it's, it seems like God. It, it's His delight. It's His pleasure to to uh, to collaborate with mankind. I mean, it doesn't make him any less God, but he's he's. Uh, and Jesus did the same thing with the fishes and loaves. Mm -hmm. You give him something. Yeah. It was still his power that worked through it, but yeah. he invited them to participate. Well, I'll find it. Okay. And we have to delight in the fact that he's still doing that today. In our, in our life, God, God is working mm -hmm. through his faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wish it wasn't in February when you had to prune. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Should we have to prune them in any 
is it in any uh, month with an R in it? I think. I know you can plant a tree in any month with an R. You should be able to. I mean, there's always times better to prune, but should any time before they leaf out, you're good. <laughs> Okay. Well, at least God was completely up front without him. You know, he told him in advance, just spelled it right out what was going to happen if he, if he ate that fruit, you know. Yeah. Some people say that they didn't know what death was. They what? Had what? Never, oh. They had never seen death. Uh, and that's what one thing that I listened to said that there would have been no death at this point. Like, without sin entering, there was no death. Um, the trees wouldn't have died. Like, I don't know. Like, everything would have been basically perennial. Um, everything was permanent because God said that everything was good. There wouldn't have been any death. And so, because that only came as the curse, and the ground yeah. became cursed, and the whole earth. Yeah. So, we don't really realize how much different the world is because death entered. Sin entered, causing death. Um, how much that changed the earth, creation. And then I've, I've mostly lived in, in uh, like urban or suburban areas in my lifetime, and I'm thoroughly enjoying being as much a part of um, Markleysburg and, and this whole area. It's great. And uh, for one, one thing. I'm aware of it. I was not aware. When you live in the city, you're not aware of people dying. Yeah. They make death so antiseptic, and nobody mm -hmm. talks about it. Mm -hmm. But actually, up here, if you draw the circle big enough, there are people dying almost every day. Yeah. And and I, I'm saying that respectfully. That, that uh, yeah, and that's I don't want to say it's part of life, but. Um, it, it gives people a lot of compassion for someone who's lost a loved one because we've all lost loved ones. Yes. Mm -hmm. But death is painful. The Bible amply allows for grief. Mm -hmm. People are expected actually to hurt. And, and that's a reaction to death and i they even say it's it's so important for a person to really freely grieve right. and if you try to repress it and stuff it it's not healthy yeah and, uh, and there's stages of grief too mm -hmm. different stages that you go through uh, like denial anger like there's different stages that you go through that you need to go through with the grieving process See, that's interesting what you said there. You need to go through Yes, right? you need to go through that process. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was God's plan. So he knew that all this would happen, right? He knew it. Even though he created with no death, God knew that the, this was all going to happen. Because the very beginning. Jesus is the Lamb slain Amen. from the foundation, the foundation of the world. Of the world. And so world. before there was sin, yeah. God knew we would need saved from it. Mm -hmm. So that tree was there because it was part of the plan. He knew that yeah. that that man would sin and the curse, and then we would need our Savior. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we've uh, talked in our other studies about the tree of knowledge of good and evil and how you can either be seeking, basically your in your life you can be seeking the knowledge of good and evil or you could be seeking life. I know we, we had those studies. I can't remember everything that was said and talked about. Wish Chuck was here to elaborate on it. He's got a good concept of it, but um, what are we seeking? Are we seeking our own knowledge, seeking our own wisdom apart from God, or are we seeking after life? 
and Adam and Eve made the choice to seek after. They wanted to be wise in their own understanding. Thought there was something was being held out from away from them, that they needed to attain it. But they had life. They gave it up for the pursuit of knowledge. Um, So it says to him, for in that day you shall surely die. Does anyone have a reason or an idea of why they would die? Because they ate from the tree? Like why would that be the punishment? <laughs> or it's not really, is it a punishment or is it just a consequence? The consequence of knowing good from evil. So, like, did, did they die because of their disobedience? Or is it the consequence of knowing good from evil? Say disobedience myself. It's pretty plain. It's really cool not to do it. Yeah. Well, I would say the angels no good from evil. Uh, they don't die, right? I would say, yeah. And then the knowledge, though, that comes when your eyes are open, then you understand why you have to die. You have to. You understand like why. Why what you did is sinful, so you're accountable. Um, mm -hmm. That comes into play because when you don't know when you're totally innocent there is no sin and then once you know what sin is then you're accountable and i think that <coughs> happened that's a multi it all multifaceted <laughs> thing that happened there all at once is they they chose to disobey and in that act their eyes were open Yeah, I think I think later on it says they it, uh, they become like us, right, or something like that, because they ate. Yeah, it's uh, they become like God. Verse three, no, chapter three, verse four. Oh, he ne well, that's a that could be a lie from Satan, but it says God knows that in that day you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. It's making me really aware of what we need to be delivered from through the cross, through Jesus, through re rebirth. You know, we um, we'd be we'd be buried in all of this if, if it wasn't for Jesus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. This says that in the concordance here, knowledge of good and evil refers to moral knowledge or ethical discernment. Adam and Eve possessed both life and moral discernment as they came from the hand of God. And it says in eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve sought a creaturely source of discernment in order to be morally independent of God. Hmm. They knew what they were doing, <laughs> basically. No, yeah. they thought they knew what they were Yeah, they thought they knew. <laughs> they thought they really knew. You know, it just, it really all comes down to, do you trust God? Yeah. Or do you not trust God? Do you believe what he has said? Are you willing to to not have everything you could have because he has said that some things are off limits? Or are you unwilling to trust him? Or do you have to go see for yourself? And I was the guy who had to go see for myself for a long time. And oof, the consequences that I brought on myself, I would you know, 
No, we shot anybody. That's on the other end of the spectrum. That's all I stuff I don't want any part of that. I don't, I don't want any of that. that. I don't see anything positive coming from that. I have a lot of friends that drove each other today. It says that they made me say that. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what they, he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, <clears throat> that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So it's not good for man to be alone. And that is very true, I think. Uh, I think I've heard that, you know, without someone to communicate with, without someone to bounce your ideas off of, right? <laughs> You'll believe that your ideas are good, right? <laughs> and if you continue to believe your ideas are good in perpetuity without someone ever, ever there to say, shouldn't be doing that, or that's not a good idea, you know, we can convince ourselves of almost anything and basically it basically can lead to insanity um to be alone long enough um i know i talked to a truck driver one time he went over the road for a while and he said that in his solitude in his truck he began to despise people he didn't want anything to do with people. He just wanted to be alone. And the more alone he became, the more he didn't want to be around anyone. He just wanted to be alone. And he was driving one day and he was just like, his whole life was almost nothing but hate of other people. I mean, barely ever was around or you know, he just had built up this hatred for people and he it was self-perpetuating because he never really had any interactions with anybody other than himself and the people that he interacted with on the road, <laughs> which he had road rage. That'll so make you crazy. It just yeah. perpetuated. And, and one day he just pulled into a truck stop and he called his, his uh, company and said, listen, I can't do this anymore. I, I hate who I've become in this solitude, basically. And quit and and got another job and slowly worked back into society, basically. To engage with people in a level to where you you have you felt compassion, you felt some sort of love. You know, and without that, you can convince yourself. Everyone hates me, and you know nobody wants to talk to me. And they're all evil; they're all bad. You know, if you just, you know, with like solitude can lead to that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you solitary confinement in prison, what that does to people is unimaginable to have them just by themselves. You know, it's a form of punishment for for just for solitude. <laughs> Yeah. Not, it's not what God made us for. Yeah. Yes, so. Jesus really em em embellishes on that one too, right? His last plea is that we would be one, we would be united, that we'd be together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. 
never intended for the church to be a bunch of lone rangers. You know? right. <laughs> That's why, you know, we try to get more people to come out to studies like this, prayer times, and because God has made us all unique and he speaks to us <clears throat> differently and we have a full group of people, you know, the body is more, is we can see more of him basically, right? Because we are him, we are the body in his different forms. <clears throat> and if, we, if we're missing, I don't know what that part looks like. Mm -hmm. See, the thing is, a lot of times people are very nervous and self-conscious. You know, well, I can't go to a thing like that. Or I, I can never pray out loud. But you have to first settle right in the beginning. That number one, you're no good at Bible study. And secondly, that you are no good at praying out loud. If you can get that settled in your head, <laughs> then you won't mind coming to <laughs> I'm being a little uh, facetious. Uh, one one thing that does strike me though is how he's saying. Uh, oh yeah, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And I, I, I my wife and I have been married for fifty seven years. And it took most of those 57 years to get over, to go beyond being preoccupied as a husband about the fact that the husband's the head of the household, and the husband's the boss, and the husband's the son. It took, took me maybe 50 years to get over that. And uh, then you realize, a helpmate, a helpmate, that's, that's somebody that, that you can work together with and rely on. Um, and it multiplies. I'll, I'll, I'll bet, Rich, I'll bet you've come to that stage. You know, you, 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 you have a helper, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm only on 42. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. One of the things I listened to said that the word helper here, um, that God characterizes himself as a helper through the Holy Spirit, like like right. the same language that it uses for the helpmate. Oh, yeah. The same language yeah. that the Holy Spirit is with you. Comes alongside you. Mm -hmm. Helps you to and if we, you know, it's not demeaning to be a helper or God would be demeaning himself when he comes and helps. I I Learned, learned the hard way that if if we're making simple little decisions like we're going to the grocery store and we're sweet order that or order, and, and one of you just has to make a decision <laughs> period and it's no big deal. but on major decisions you know do you want to add a uh an extension on your house it's going to cost fifteen thousand dollars you don't pull rank on your wife you <laughs> say i'm going to do this and i don't care what you think you know man you you got to be together on something like that. You know? <clears throat> well, I think just like the Holy Spirit is our helper, um, it's all in love. Just like your marriage, you know, it's all in love. You have that love for each other. You have the love of Christ. So mm -hmm. that's how your 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 mates, you know, you help each other. You love each other. If there's not love there, then you're not going to want to help. You're not going to want to be with that person. And it's just like Christ's love for us through the Holy Spirit helps us. It's, it's all based on love. So you God is. You can't trust somebody who no. you don't believe really loves you and has your best interests at heart. But when you know that, then you can trust them. Please forgive me for getting into chapter three, but it, it's only making a point that applies to chapter two. So that's my excuse. But it says here, uh, Satan actually addressed the woman when he went to tempt somebody. He, he told Adam, back in chapter 2, he told Adam, commanded Adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when it came to testing somebody, mm -hmm. he, he went to Eve and said, this is what it is. And here's what it says about Eve in that situation. And I'm not making a point about men and women because I think we'd all do the same thing. 
But when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, number one, good for food, pleasing to the eye, number two, and desirable for gaining wisdom, number three. And you know, later on in the Bible, Jesus is tempted three times. Mm. And you can just about look at that and match that up with this, this thing here. Mm -hmm. And then later on, old John the Apostle in, in his first letter, you know, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world for all that is in the world. And then he names three things. Um, Blessed of the flesh, yeah. Blessed of the eyes, and the pride, pride of life. And, pride of life. and those are the three things there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, that's good to eat. That's blessed of the flesh, pleasing to the eye, less of the eyes, and then gaining knowledge would be to have pride. Yeah, it's pretty. Oh, no, definitely. Like Christ. They tempted Jesus too, the same way. Bread. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. And he took one of the ribs, one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place, and the rib which was the then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, "You know, that's funny. We had a skit at VBS one, I think, in vacation Bible school one time, and uh, I think it was Pastor Meter, Matt Meter, like twenty years ago." But Adam is standing there, and then Eve comes out, and uh, he says, Whoa, man. And the guy's like, Woman, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I always think of that, like, Oh, man. <laughs> Do you, what does it say? Is this that nap? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Look up. Um, Which one? Let's see. Two. Well, the man said. Two, say 223, mm -hmm. chapter 2, verse 23. The man said, finally, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, name her woman, for she was made for me. Finally. <laughs> like, he must have been lonely for a while. <laughs> He's and like, fi finally. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it is, it's amazing. Um, he, he, it says he created all of creation from the ground, all the things. He made man from the dust of the earth. He did not make woman from the dust of the earth. He could have made it a, a woman, another being. Right. But he took it from the man, and that I think that brought a special relationship mm -hmm. between those mm -hmm. two, beyond just two creatures of opposite sex, because mm -hmm. they're from the same flesh. That mm -hmm. yeah, you return bones, the bones. Flesh and flesh. Yeah. And you know, the world would say, oh, we're just treat marriage like a business arrangement, you know? And it's way more. That's the smallest part of it. <laughs> the most biggest part is becoming <clears throat> united together, you know, and man, I don't know. It's it's amazing um, if you allow it to happen you know, through the pride of life. I think you 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 don't want to humble yourself and unite with another person. You want to be your own man and you want to be independent of someone. And, you know, um, but if you do unite with your wife and. You have to, I think you give up a part of yourself or something. I don't know how that all happens, but you wouldn't have to give up a part of yourself. You're taking on, taking on someone else, right? Isn't like marriage like the cross, like the, our relationship with Christ, like your marriage is kind of, I was kind of taught that, like, you know, like 
you give of yourself like Christ gave. You know, isn't that part of you know? Well, I mean, and that's yeah, scripture, scripture too. Scripture from you know Ephesians, but yeah. um, you know, I was always like taught like the cross, like your marriage was kind of like that too, like <laughs> together. Mm -hmm. Your new creation, like the two of you. I think I've seen a something I can't that, remember. Like that, There's that. something like that. Like, but I think it's sort of like the three three cord, the three stranded cord that's unbreakable. To you, your wife and God are your yeah. co-mingled. The cord is unbreakable. Yeah. If you remove it, a two stranded cord is easily broken. But a three stranded cord is Exponentially stronger. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the world tries to mess up everything God says, right? So now we have children that never leave home. <laughs> they stay, you know, they they don't want to break that bond, whatever, you know. Well, and there's an attack on the very uh, elements of man and woman. And, mm -hmm. you know, the society today is trying to convince you that you can't even know which one you are. And it could change from day to day. And, you know, yeah. everything that God puts in place, Satan attacks and tries to bring confusion. Yeah. So trying to break, Satan's breaking down the family. That's what he wants. He wants disorder, he wants confusion. Right. I've watched a thing like, you know, we're just stardust bouncing into stardust <laughs> or whatever, you know. We're, there is no special thing. If we weren't created by God, if he didn't breathe life into us, I, you know, I don't, I really don't know what drives an atheist to do anything. I don't know. But with a, without hope, to live without hope, it's just so unimaginable to me. Like you deny the existence of God, deny Surprise. you're denying the, yeah. the design of the universe, the design of the earth, the design of human beings. Um, just like we said last week, it just creation shouts and screams that there was a designer. Um, and the randomness does not produce anything. I mean, one of the fundamental laws of thermodynamics is that order always deconstructs into disorder. It's the chaos comes from order. And nothing ever forms into more order. It goes from order to chaos. And like... <laughs> Randomness doesn't produce order. Chaos doesn't produce order. And it's actually a law of the universe that, <laughs> that order doesn't come out of nothing. It's randomness. But to believe in evolution, to believe that this is all random, you have to break a lot of laws. A lot of the laws that the scientists will say is a law but well in this one case yeah we have to break <laughs> almost every law there is to produce to life. serve our ideology yeah, to produce really life yeah. to produce life you had to break every law <laughs> of the universe you know because it's supernatural it's not natural life is not natural life is supernatural it's beyond beyond the laws of nature it doesn't happen without something supernatural happening which is formed him from the dust of the earth and he breathed like you know just and you have to come to terms with that and once you once you agree that you are created and you have to find out 
who this creator is. When you find out who the creator is, the God of love who created this thing with coming one flesh. This is so amazing what he's created. It shouts his love for us. And the design of the head is genius, beyond genius. All we can do is tinker, really, with what he has done. And if we ever do get the capability to go do more than tinker, we will destroy this creation. We will mess it up so bad that we won't be able to. <laughs> so I'm glad we haven't tinkered too much. I think the cloning. Yeah, yeah. cloning. Mm -hmm. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. <laughs> because we've that total innocence, right? Right. Uh, right. We were just with God, and everything was good, and we trusted God, and there was no death. I mean, it's living in the presence of God. I don't know what that would entail or what that would look like exactly, but we'll find out one day when we are restored to the original, well, even greater creation of the universe. It's going to be amazing. And we'll go back to that where we're not ashamed. There'll be no sin, so. We will not have shame. <laughs> totally unashamed before God. That's our robe of righteousness. The robe of righteousness. Right now, through clothed. Jesus Christ, we have no shame, no guilt. Yeah. He's covered us. With yeah, to blood. live in that right yeah. now. Yeah. We need to live in that. Yeah, yeah it won't do us any good to just think about it. <laughs> you you got to live yeah. in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. His child. So we'll think about that and next week we'll do three the fall of man. Ooh. Ooh. Mm. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, yeah. Well, we can. Yeah. yeah. So we'll turn off the recording. Anybody has any questions? Anything they want to say that they didn't want on the recording?